Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence here as we open your word together. We're thankful for the time that we have to study, for the work that you are doing in our lives, in the lives of those around us, and we ask for your continued blessing. Uh, we pray, Lord, that as we uh, look at these things here in your word relating to uh, the civil wars, that you can guide and direct, and that you can uh, give us understanding. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 7. Of course, we need some background uh, there. So we know that there's a civil war, a civil war that's happening uh, between um, uh, Pekka, who is going to be, um, uh, he's the king of Israel, and he's going to have a uh, confederacy with uh, Reason, king of Ser Syria. Now, when it came to to studying the 2520s, part of the prophetic mirror, when I first started um, sharing this on Facebook, uh, there was a group called, um, what were they called? Can't even remember what they were called. But uh, there's a whole bunch of people there opposed to the 2520. And so uh, that's where I started sharing it. And um, uh, so, so I had to spend a lot of time looking at the information and um, confirming that this chronology was correct. So this is even before um, I had completed all my study of chronology part of it was what led me to looking at the chronology in much more detail than I, I would have so um, the criticism was that in four, 742 BC uh, that wasn't when this civil war occurred right so um, these people were challenging Usher's chronology um, and so we're going to look at some of those objections. But one of the things we will see here, it says, In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel began, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Uzziah is sometimes called Azariah, right? And, and so you're going to have uh, Jotham, he's going to begin reigning when he's 25 years old. He's going to reign 16 years in Jerusalem. And um, uh, so he's... Uh, and when we go here, um, it says, in those days, the Lord began to send against Judah, reason, the king of Syria and Pekah, the son of Remaliah. So that means began. Um, this is just like the opening, well, one of the ways to begin as if by an opening wedge. So that's one of the definitions of this word. So at this time, it says, the Lord began to send against Judah, Re Reason, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah. And Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the sea of David, his father. And Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. So we can see here that this civil war already is beginning in the time of Jotham, right? But it's just beginning. So when we go to Isaiah chapter 7, and it's going to say, it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that reason the king of Samaria, or Samaria, Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. So if this is true that it began in the days of Jotham, that means uh, at the time when Ahaz becomes king, now it says here in the days of Ahaz. So one of the guys, um, I can't remember his name, you know, he would say, oh, it could be any time in the reign of Ahaz. But we know it's not. We know it's at the beginning of his reign. Because if it already began in the time of his father's uh, 
reign, near the end of his reign, then uh, there would be no point in talking about this just any time in Ahaz's reign. Now, why would it say in the days of Ahaz? Why doesn't it say in the first year of Ahaz or the second year of Ahaz or whatever? Why, why does it just say in the days of Ahaz? What, what would be the reason that they would use this sort of indefinite uh, phrase? Why are they painting this with such broad strokes? Well, that's the way a person could read it. Wouldn't it be to require us to investigate, to see how we would place this? Um, well, maybe, but I would just think the simple answer to that is it's not in his first year yet, right? It's at the transition between his father's reign and his reign. So, I mean, they could have said in the first year of Ahaz, but it's not technically his first year yet, right? His father has just died. Because if this war has already begun in the time of his father and his father's died, then the natural thing to say is in the days of Ahaz, right? To me, this would be a natural way to say it. If it was sometime later in his reign, then it would make sense to give a year of his reign. But at the beginning of his reign, there's no need to do so. And, and here it says it was told the house of David, right? Which is, of course, the house of David is Ahaz, right? Saying Syria is confederate with Ephraim and his heart was moved. That is, that's Ahaz's heart was moved and the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. So, so Ahaz is just beginning to hear about this confederacy. Now it already had begun in the time of his father, but to Ahaz it's now uh, so, so it begun, but he's not aware of it, right? Until he becomes king. When his father dies, he starts to hear about what's happening. And then said the Lord unto Isaiah, go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shergeshub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. So, so Ahaz has just become king and now the prophet Isaiah is going to come to him and give him this information. Ahaz is scared. The people are scared. They hear about what's going to be happening. And, and so this only makes sense if it's at the beginning of Ahaz's reign. It wouldn't make sense if it's some other time in, in the reign of Ahaz. It wouldn't take years for him to find out about this confederacy. Does that make sense to people? Sounds logical. So, so I, I place this in the accession year of Ahaz, not in his first year of reign. Because his first year of the reign, uh, it's either going to start in the spring or the fall of 742. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of this chronology, but uh, the thing that's pretty clear from the biblical chronology is that this is at the beginning of 742 BC. So that this, the death of Jotham would have occurred uh, probably sometime between uh, January, in, in the period of January to March. Okay, so somewhere in that time. And so the first year of Ahaz, whether it's going to be in the spring or in the fall that it begins his count, um, it wouldn't have begun. So it wouldn't be in the first year. Now, we do know from working out the chronologies of the kings of Assyria and the kings, because we're going to have, of course, the king of Assyria involved here, as well as um, uh, the king of Syria, of Aram, uh, reason that we can actually work this out really precisely to the beginning of 742 B.C. So the criticisms that uh, usually people try to bring against the 2520, especially conservative Adventists, um, when they're doing that, they're actually going to introduce uh, Edwin Thiel's chronology 
That is, Edwin Thiel is going to place this in 732 BC. So he's going to cut off uh, 45 years from, you know, the overall, the kings of Judah. Um, um, and that, and he's going to do some very odd things, like make uh, Hezekiah begin to reign 10 years after the destruction of Samaria, even though the Bible clearly says the destruction of Samaria occurs in the sixth year of Hezekiah, right? So he's going to create all of these co-regencies um, so that you can't just add together the years of the reigns of the kings of Judah to get the total years of the reigns of the kings of Judah. Now, when people do this, when they introduce Thiel's chronology to refute the 2520 prophetic mirror, when they do that, uh, they create all kinds of other problems, all kinds of biblical contradictions. You have to reject a bunch of scripture as um, as glosses. A gloss is just something that's added as in, in a margin and that somehow got incorporated into the text. Uh, and there's no evidence for any of these uh, co-regencies that, that the Bible is uh, somehow silent about them. But they exist. That makes no sense because we do have one co-regency that's clearly stated in the Bible, um, and and that's between uh, Jehoshaphat and uh, Jehoram, right? So, and that's just a two-year co-regency, and and you that one, even though it says that there's this co-regency, doesn't tell you how long. You have to actually do some math to figure out how long it is. But these these are the types of things that people bring against the 2520. So we know that this this civil war is part of this prophetic mirror, the beginning of the prophetic mirror of the two 2520s. And it's going to have this time prophecy of 65 years. And and we also know that when we count from 742, 65 years, it brings us to 677. So this is this is well established by the pioneers. Um, even Uriah Smith would admit to this. And, and we're going to look at some details here. So some of this stuff isn't truly relevant to our study of the civil wars in, in a direct way, but it has some indirect uh, implications. So we're, we're going to take a look at some of these details that may just see a bit superfluous. But they actually are purposeful. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're going to have um, the Lord said to Isaiah. So he's going to take his son, Shergeshub. Now, uh, Shergeshub uh, is um, uh, he's, he's the son of it, uh, Isaiah. We don't know how old he is. Uh, but his name means a remnant shall return. So why does he have this name? A remnant shall return. What? Why? And and just a little bit, um, uh, just to show you the the breakdown of this word, you have um, shiar, that means a remainder, and a shuv, that's the shub. It's shuv or shub, but modern Hebrew pronounces it as a V instead of a B, but shuv. Um, so that's the one that means return. It means to, to, um, sometimes translate it as turn. And it's also the first word, uh, let me see. No, uh, in, um, uh, where's that? Anyway, it's, it's in, uh, Daniel chapter nine, verse 24. And you're going to have this word shuv. Um, so the, the going forth of the commandment to re- restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, that word restore is return, shuv. Um, okay. So you have Sher Jishab. So why is he called a remnant shall return? Why, why did Isaiah name his son this? Are, are, are they in captivity at this point? Wouldn't it give him hope for the, that they was going to come back to it? But they're not in captivity, is what I'm trying to say. So this is not a time when Israel is in captivity to anyone. 
right? They're not in captivity to Babylon. They're not in captivity to Assyria. Uh, now, northern Israel is um, going to be in about 19 years, right? You know, so they're going to be in captivity, northern Israel. Uh, but if it talks about a remnant shall return, now, so he's bringing his son, who's named a remnant shall return. So why he's named that, I mean, we don't know. It doesn't tell us why Isaiah named him that. Uh, but it must be for, for a prophetic symbol. So we know that then a captivity must be occurring. Um, now, how old is Isaiah at this point? Anybody got any ideas how old Isaiah is? Do we have any indication when he became a prophet? Do we have any idea how old Isaiah was? How long he prophesied? Anything like that? Because how, how old would his son be? Do you think this is like uh, an adult son or a child? I would almost think... Uh... Not quite an adult, but not quite a child. Right. So I would think he, he's not going to be fairly, he's not going to be very old. Right. So Ellen White says the reign of Uzziah was drawing to a close when Isaiah, a young man of the royal line, was called to the prophetic uh, mission. So so he would be young when he became, uh, when he began his ministry. And this might be about, you know, six or seven years into him being a prophet when this happens, you know, as, as sort of as a guess. I mean, it's definitely not the end of his time. Um, so, so Isaiah's a young man. So maybe, maybe in his twenties, early twenties, when he becomes uh, a prophet. Okay. So, so Shab is his son. Now, and this is going to be important as far as um, when we start looking at some of the details here uh, about his other son. So he's going to have another son um, that's going to be prophesied about, um, and that's going to be uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, I can't think. Uh, Maher Shawar Hashbaz, Maher Shawar Hashbaz, right? And that's going to be born to his wife, right? So we don't know anything about Isaiah, you know, we would assume he's not going to have multiple wives, right? And that uh, the son that's going to be born to him is um, going to be from the same mother as his other son. Okay. And we don't have, I, I tried to find anything about it in the spirit of prophecy, but I haven't been able to. Um, she says anything about Isaiah's wife. So, um, so we would have to say that you know, his wife is going to have another son that's going to be named Maher Shawahashbaz. So he's got this one son named Sher Jeshub, and he's going to have another. Now, he might have more sons, but uh, we'll look at this in a little bit more, why this is relevant. Okay. So he takes Sher Jeshub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool of the highway of the fuller's field. So this is the laundromat. Now, now why, he's, why is he going to the laundromat? Why is he going to where uh, people are washing clothes? Why does Isaiah meet Ahaz there? And the word meet is the idea of accosting a person met. Right? So it's not like they have a, a prescribed uh, meeting time. He's going to catch him uh, down by the highway of the Fuller's Field, right? The upper pool, but the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field. Anybody know why he's meeting them there? 
why is he accosting him there? Why does why doesn't he just go see Isaiah, you know, at his house or wherever? Or Ahaz. Why doesn't Isaiah go see Ahaz there? Why here? Doesn't the water represent people? Okay, I'm just thinking in more practical terms. Okay. Ahaz interested in talking to Isaiah. Ahaz already has plans, even though he's frightened. He's not calling on the prophet to give him information. He's His plans are to go to the king of Assyria and get support from the king of Assyria for the, to fight against um, this confederacy, right? That's his plans. So Isaiah has to just catch him somewhere. And this is a common place that the king would pass. It, it's right near uh, whatever it is, palace or whatever. It, it's it's in um, a Jerusalem there, right? So uh, and we'll look at this a little bit later when it comes to uh, the other guy. I can't think of his name. Um, who's going to give a speech there uh, to Hezekiah. Okay. So um, so he's going to meet them. He's going to accost him here. Going to take it, you know, just run into him. Um, and then he's going to give his this message, say unto him, take heed and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of these smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of reason is Syria and of the son of Remaliah, which is Pekah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. Uh, Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of the Damascus is reason. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Now, we've looked at this many times before. So we know that uh, the capital of Syria is Damascus, and the king, the head, is going to be reason. And also uh, the capital of Ephraim is Samaria and the king is Remaliah's son, also known as Pekah. Um, so, so there's these, uh, this confederacy of the king of Syria and uh, the king of Ephraim or of Northern Israel, right? And we, we know that this, this idea of coming up to the neck is connected to this idea of the head, right? So when we talk about the head later in this king of the north and the king of the south, um, we know that the king of the south in, in our history, that when we said it just comes up to the neck, that the head survives, Jeff was saying that that's Moscow. We, we have concluded that it's actually not Moscow, but uh, the philosophy of atheistic communism that moves from the USSR to the UN, right? So, the, but this is, this idea comes from here, chapter seven and chapter eight. So you have this head, right? Which is, uh, in this case, the king, but also it uses the word head to refer to the capital. And that's why Jeff was saying, well, the capital that's Moscow, so Moscow is the head. But we can see above the head is, above the capital, is a king, and that's going to represent not a person, per se, uh, but a philosophy. Okay? Any questions about this so far? Okay, then we have this word within three score and five years. So the critics of the prophetic mirror uh, will say, well, this is anywhere within a 65-year period. 
Now, of course, it's true that it's going to be in 19 years that Hoshea is taken captive, right? From 21 years to the destruction of Samaria. But to when Ephraim is being broken, well, that's going to be 19 years. And so they're just, but the question is, why would they, they give this phrase of 65 years if it's just going to be anywhere within a 65 year period? That seems kind of odd from a prophetic point of view. So, you know, when you ask critics of the 2520, well, when does the 65 years end? Um, people have no, no place to put this, right? If they're going to have 732, you know, there's no event marking the end of 65 years unless you take it as 742 to 677 and you have Manasseh's captivity in 677. Now, also, the other thing about this word within, um, it's not really the word within at all. Now, if you look at the definition, it's this, this word, odd, and it means a going around, a continuance, still, yet, again, besides, right, still, or yet, a continuance of persistence, still yet more an addition or repetition, again. So, why is it translated as within if it means again? So the idea is it's an iteration, right? Something that's repeated, right? So it's nice and convenient if you just look at the King James and you just say, well, it's within 65 years. That's what it says. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say within 65 years. So any thoughts on this? Why does it say again 65 years and Ephraim shall be both broken? What's being repeated and by who? Okay, first off, who is the message given to? Is it given to uh, the king of Israel or the king of Judah? King of Judah, ain't it? Yeah, so it's the king of Judah. So this is a warning to the king of Judah, right? It's It's not a warning to the king of Israel. The king of Israel might know nothing about this. This prophecy. So Isaiah is coming to the king of Judah and saying that this is this confederacy is going to be broken. But it says again, three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. So Ephraim is going to be broken, but it has this good yeah. yeah. Which is Israel, right? Yeah, it, it, that's Israel. So that's northern kingdom, right? Now, so this is actually a prophecy for Judah. And so then, moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Now, Ahaz has no intentions of listening to Isaiah. And his plans is, is to uh, look to the king of Assyria. And so this idea, neither will I tempt the Lord, is just um, posturing on his part. He's, he's feigning uh, that his reason is that he doesn't want to tempt the Lord. But of course, that's not the real reason. He's being deceptive. So and 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 so uh, Isaiah says, "Hear now, ye, O house of David." So the house of David is specifically what? What is the house of David? It's Judah. Right. It's the kingship of Judah. Right. This is talking to the house of David. But notice he's not going to talk to just Ahaz. He's giving this message to the house of David. That is, the house of David is going to include the descendants of King Ahaz. Because King Ahaz is of the line of David. 
He's the king. So the house of David is the kingship, the Davidic line, right? So he says, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, we know that critics of Christianity have lots to say about the word that's being used here, virgin, because it's going to be Alma. And there's another word that uh, is usually used to refer to a virgin. So this is just, um, this could refer to somebody who's newly married as well. Uh, but the idea here that we, we understand is that this is going to apply prophetically as a symbol to the birth of Christ. But in the context here, it can't be about Christ's birth because this is going to be about the civil war that's going on. So it says, butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land which thou pourest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Now, the way that this is commonly interpreted is that the land that thou abhorrest is the land of northern Israel and Syria. And that it's going to be forsaken of both her kings. But this doesn't make any sense um, uh, in the context of what's going on here. So what is the land that Ahaz and the house of David is abhorring? What land is it? How do they abhor the land? Are they allowing the land to rest? No. And so the land that they abhorrest that is being punished because of, of this failure to keep the sabbatical rest of the land, we can see if you go back to Leviticus 26, it's going to be your enemies are going to come in, right? So since they're not obeying the sabbatical rest of the land, they're having this, these nations coming in, which are eventually going to take them captive. Right. First with northern Israel, it's going to be carried captive to Assyria. And then uh, Judah is going to be taken captive to Babylon. And then it says the land that thou pourest shall be forsaken of both your kings. Well, Hosea is taken captive 19 years later. And then 65 years later, Manasseh is taken captive. So there the land is forsaken of both her kings. And that has to happen before the child that shall be born shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, if we look at uh, the mother of Manasseh, her name is Hephzibah. And Hephzibah in Isaiah chapter 62 refers to the land. Verse four, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephziba and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, and this is the word Bethula, which is the one that usually means virgin, virgin uh, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as a bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall God rejoice over thee. So you can see this, the name of Manasseh's mother is related to um, God's people in the land. Uh, so being Hephzibah, this is a virgin that's going to give birth to a son, right? And, and that can't be Isaiah's wife, right? Because this is what people will do is they will say, well, that child that's going to be called Emmanuel is the same one that's called Mahershala Hashbaz. So we're going to have in chapter eight, we have, it says, I went unto the prophetess and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, call his name Mahershala Hashbaz. Before, before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. So 
This is going to be in the context immediately of the end of the Civil War, right, in 739. So that's when uh, Samaria is going to be um, uh, defeated, right? So there's a lot lot there that we, we'd have to look at, but we can't look at it right now. But the main thing that we can see here is that this child that's going to be born, so... Um, so he's going to, uh, at this time, so it's going to be at least another nine months, right, till this child is born. So if we're saying this is 742, you know, this could be uh, early 743 or, or 741, pardon me. And then uh, the child will have the knowledge to cry my, uh, my father and my mother. So he's going to be able to, to speak. Um, so at some point in that history of this child being born, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. That is, the king of Assyria is going to come in and conquer those territories to some degree, right? Especially Syria. So that confederacy is going to be broken in that history. So it's either going to be in, in 740 or 739, somewhere in there. Okay. So does this make sense? That, that this child here is dealing with the actual end of the Civil War. But the child in Chapter 7 is referring to a later history, right? Because it's before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. So this would refer to when is the child know to refuse evil and choose good? What What would that generally be, even if we were going to? Related that it's just a child that was going to be born. What would this be? Would that be two years old? That'd be, would that be the, um, the, the age of accountability? Yes, it would be some kind of age of accountability. At the very least, you would have to say that this child would have to be accountable, right? And now, but it says before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. That that land that thou art poor shall be forsaken of both her kings. Now, if this child is Manasseh, when does child, when does Manasseh refuse the evil and choose the good? When is he going to do that? He's going to do that after he's taken captive, right? And brought to Assyria, or more specifically, to the city of Babylon within Assyria, right? So we know about Manasseh. Um, uh, check around the chapter. Here we go. Um, that it's going to say, and the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. So one is he's carried to Babylon at the time when the king of Assyria is in control of Babylon. And the only time that that happens in that history is when Esar Hayden is the king of Assyria. So that's going to be in, in 677. And he had just finished rebuilding Babylon the year before. And it says, when he was in a fit affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. So is that when Manasseh knows to refuse the evil and choose the good? It would look that way. Now, um, we're going to look at this document. So this is a document. Uh, now, some people date the document different. Most people would date this document um, either in 678 or 677. Um, there's some people that put it in 673, which actually doesn't make sense when you look at the, the chronology of Assyria. But but this is uh, uh, S.R. Hayden, who's the king of Assyria um, from uh 781 to, um, well, it's about 10 years, so probably to um, 
781, I can't remember the year they usually give. It's, it's 10 or 11 years, anyway, that he's king of Assyria. So he's king of Assyria in 677. In 678, he has rebuilt Babylon because his father destroyed Babylon. And, um, but he wants to make Babylon a temporary capital. So he kind of unites Babylon with Assyria. But he writes this. He says, I called up the kings of the country Hatti and of the region on the other side of the river Euphrates. Now, this word called up in Assyrian is a word called Adkima. So it's Adkima. Now, called up is not a good translation. But they make it look like he just sort of invited them, right? Uh, but the idea here is, is the best way to translate is to muster. You could also get gathered up the kings of the country of the Hatti and the region of the other side of the river Euphrates. So um, it's used, if you look at the Assyrian documents, the word akima is used in the gathering of building materials, uh, in the marshalling of armies for war, or the gathering of prisoners. So it would make most sense that, that these are being taken captive. So what happened to Manasseh is also going to happen uh, to all these other kings. There's going to be 22 of them. Now, he, he names them Baal, king of Tyre, Manasseh, king of Judah, some guy's name from Edom, Missouri, king of Moab, you know, Sil Silbel, king of Gaza, right? So he lists off these different kings' names. And you can confirm through archaeology uh, when these people are kings. So one thing that people do who don't accept the 2520, they say, um, you know, Manasseh wasn't taken captive in 677. He wasn't taken captive by Esser Hayden. And, and some people try to say, well, this is just, you know, referring to these kings when he called them up. He's just asking for money, right? So there's going to be 12 kings from the sea coast. He's going to list them as well. Ten kings from Cyprus amidst, amidst the sea. And then he says together, 22 kings of Hatti, the seashore, and the islands. And here's what he says he does. All these I sent out and made them transport under terrible difficulties to Nineveh, the town of my rulership, as building material for my palace. Big logs, long beams, and thin boards, boards from cedar and pine trees, products of the Sarara and Lebanon mountains, which had grown for a long time into tall and strong timber, also from their quarries in the mountains, statues of Lamasa and Shedu protective deities made of Asan stone, statues of uh, Zastu, threshold slabs of limestone. So all these different materials, trees, stone, right? He's having them haul this to Nineveh. So is this merely uh, S.R. Hayden uh, asking for tribute? Because he says, I made them transport under terrible difficulties to Nineveh. I sent out and made them. Now, is this just saying, you know, I asked them to do this and they did this, you know, with servants and stuff? Or did they actually do this themselves personally? Now, why would uh, S.R. Hayden take these kings captive, bring them to Babylon, and then make them haul personally this timber and these stones. Why would he do that? Remember the king of Assyria and the king of Babylon, they ran a protection racket. And in a protection racket, you have to pay your protection money. And who are you going to have protect you? If you're going to pay money, you're going to you're going to have the person who is uh, one. He's the biggest threat to you. Um, but you're not going to pay protection money to some lower thug. 
when this more powerful thug is asking you to pay, you know, to pay protection money. So by taking these kings and showing his power, he's rebuilding a Babylon. So he's going to take them to Babylon, show them Babylon. Right. And it doesn't make any other sense, like to have it some later king of Assyria um, near the end of Manasseh's reign. Who's going to take him? Why would he take him to Babylon? Right here, there's a logical reason why he would take him to Babylon. He just finished rebuilding it. And he's going to take all these other kings. He's going to show them what he built. And he's going to have them work as slaves. It's the most logical way to look at it. But people who oppose the 2520 will not accept this, even though it's such plain language. And we know that when he was in affliction, that's when Manasseh turned to God. And then God returned him. Now, this would be affliction, wouldn't it? Having to work as a slave for the king of Assyria. And we know the king, this king, Esar Haven, did this with other people, that he didn't just, he's not just asking for tribute money. He's actually taking these kings and making them work as slaves. Now, whether all of them are returned, I don't know. Probably they are, because the whole idea is you're going to return them, and they're going to be very loyal. And he's doing it in this area because you have Egypt that is also seeking to horn it in on that territory, right? They're trying to take that territory of the Levant and get tribute money for Egypt. So the king of Assyria... He's being proactive. He's going to make sure that, that these people are loyal to him. And, of course, he is more powerful at this time than the king of Egypt. But they're going to have some wars. He's actually even going to go into Egypt uh, later. They're going to have a battle with Egypt. So, so this is why this is happening. It's the only time it makes sense. So, so this is going to be 677, right? So it's just showing you that this 65 years has this connection to Manasseh being taken captive. It's the most logical thing uh, to, to accept. But again, you know, people who are opposed to the 2520, they will fight tooth and nail against any idea that Manasseh was taken captive in 677. So they're going to say, no, he's just, he's just paying tribute. Well, we know Manasseh was taken captive by the king of Assyria, according to the Bible, and he was carried to Babylon. And the most logical place for this to occur is here. Also, when we look at Ellen White's statement regarding this. So I'll find the statement here first. Okay. <clears throat> Some of those who suffered persecution during Manasseh's reign were commissioned to bear special messages of reproof and judgment. The king of Judah, the prophets declared, hath done wickedly above all which were before him. Because of this wickedness, his kingdom was nearing a crisis. Soon the inhabitants of the land were be, to be carried captive to Babylon, there to become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. But the Lord would not utterly forsake those who in a strange land should acknowledge him as their ruler. They might suffer great tribulation, yet he would bring deliverance to them in his appointed time and way. Those who should put their trust wholly in him would find a sure refuge. Now, Think about this. So this, when it talks about the kingdom of Judah, is going to be carried captive to Babylon, right? Uh, that's going to happen when? When is that going to begin? It begins with Daniel's captivity in the third year of Jehoiakim, right? So, so that's going to be about 70 years later. So faithfully, the prophets continued their warnings and exhortations. Fearlessly, they spoke to Manasseh. And to his people, but the messengers were scorned. Backsliding Judah would not heed. As an earnest, which is like a down payment, of what would befall the people should they continue impenitent. The Lord permitted their king to be captured by a band of Assyrian soldiers who bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Their temporary capital. The affliction uh, brought the king to his senses. He besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. 
and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Um, now it says here, so here's one of the things that they argue about. They say, but this repentance, remarkable though it was, came too late to save the kingdom from the corrupting influence of years of idolatrous practices. Many had stumbled and fallen, never to rise again, or again to rise. Among those whose life experience had been shaped beyond recall by the fatal apostasy of Manasseh was his own son, who came to the throne at the age of 22. And so what they say here regarding Ammon, that if Ammon was affected by his father's apostasy, he must have been born before Manasseh was converted. But when Manasseh had for 22 years uh, brought in all of this false worship, his repentance did not save the kingdom from the corrupting influence of years of idolatrous practices. So are there people still practicing uh, this false worship, even though Manasseh is converted? According to Ellen White, we'd have to say yes. And Ammon is affected by these people, not by his. He wasn't alive when his dad was doing these things. Right. He wasn't born yet because it's going to be he's going to be born about 10 years after his dad's uh, conversion. But he's still going to be affected by it. So he's going to. He walked in all the way that his father walked in and served idols that his father served and worshipped them. And he forsook the Lord God of his fathers. He humbled, humbled not himself before the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. The wicked king was not permitted to reign long in the midst of his daring and piety. Only two years from the time he ascended the throne, he was slain in the palace by his own servants. And the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. So we know Josiah is going to be eight years old uh, when he's made king. So, <clears throat> so here we have uh, something else. So when Ellen White is referring to uh, this being the temporary capital of, of Assyria, the Babylon is the temporary capital, she is accepting the understanding of the day, right? So, if she is believing something different than a 677 BC captivity of Manasseh, she's not showing it. Because one of the main arguments that people have is that the reason that he's carried to Babylon is because Esar Hayden is the king of Assyria. And so, people in her day who would be reading this paragraph would accept that Ellen White is referring to 677. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to look at uh, something here as well regarding uh, what A.T. Jones says about this, about uh, this date. I'll just go here. Okay, so this is an interesting article. It's from the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. Um, and it's going to be uh, July 26th, 1898. One of the leading preachers of the United States has published a book on the puzzling books of the Bible, of which he has found seven. Uh, the book is written not so much to tell how puzzling these books are to him, you know, why they're puzzling to him as it is to make it appear that other people that to other people that these books are puzzling books to them. Another thing that may be noted is that this book he has dealt only with the books, old books that are puzzling to him, and therefore, as a matter of course, are or ought to be puzzling to everybody else. He has not touched the particular passages or verses of the Bible outside of the special books which are puzzling. 
But why should even a preacher think that because certain books of the Bible are puzzling to him, this fact can be of so much importance to other people as to call for the publication of a book on it? Does it certainly follow that because something is puzzling to him, it must be puzzling to everybody else, especially as soon as it is known that it is puzzling to him? Now, the only possible way that any book or passage of the Bible can be puzzling to anybody is by his not believing it. And there are many things, even outside the Bible, that puzzling to the person who does not believe them. The ABCs are exceedingly puzzling to any man who does not believe them. Neither the Bible nor any book or passage in the Bible is any more puzzling to the person who believes it than are the ABCs to the person who believes them. But that is just the trouble with these critics. They do not believe the Bible. They do not accept it as the word of God. They are critics of the word of God, not believers of the word of God. They do not receive the word of God for what it is in truth, the word of God. They hold it off and criticize it and puzzle over it. So it cannot work effectually in them because they do not believe it. They do not accept the word of God, even when they believe it to be true. It is clear from this. Ever since 677 BC, the Bible has said the captains of the host of the king of Assyria took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with feathers, fetters and carried him to Babylon. One of the critics have said that until lately, this passage has always been a stumbling block to the critics. And the only means by which it was ever a stumbling block to the critics was solely because they did not believe it. The stumbling block that they found in this passage was in that it says that the Assyrians brought Manasseh to Babylon. Well, it was known that Nineveh was the capital of the kingdom of Assyria. The critics thought that it should have said that they brought Manasseh to Nineveh. And because it did not say what they thought, it was a stumbling block. But what caused this passage to cease to be a stumbling block? Why? The records of Esarhaddon, who was then king of Assyria, were discovered. And these records told that Babylon was subdued and possessed by Assyria, and that Babylon was his residence in those years. But now the point. They did not believe before that the passage told the truth, and of course, of course did not believe it to be the word of God. Now, however, they admit that the passage tells and always did tell the exact truth. But why do they believe this now? Not because it is the word of God, but only because of what S.R. Hayden has said. And if they had not yet found these words of S.R. Hayden or others to the same effect, they would not yet believe that the passage tells the truth. It would still be to them a stumbling block. Therefore, as they believed it now only on the authority of Esser Hayden and not on the authority of God, it is perfectly plain that though they now believe it to be true, they do not so believe it because it is the word of God. The authority which they accept rests upon the truth of the passage is the authority of a man, not of God. Uh, and whoever accepts the word of God on the authority of man has only the word of the man. To him, the word of God is only the word of, a, of the man. The word of man is put above the word of God, and man is put in the place of God. So we need to believe the Bible. Uh, but you can see that people will use human reasoning with the lack of knowledge, specific knowledge, to reject something in the scriptures that is, is pretty plain. So, we, I mean, we understand these things, uh, but we need to keep them in mind when we study God's word, is that sometimes there isn't 100% solid evidence for something that's plainly stated in the word of God. Sometimes there's even contradictory evidence that is things that we can't explain from you know secular history but the more we examine it the more closely we see that the bible aligns with reality and this was my experience in studying this out i listened to what people said who had criticized 742 bc and 677 and the more i examined it the more I found that the evidence was solid. And I can present that evidence to people who reject the 2520. 
and they will continually deny that the evidence is supporting 2520. So this one guy who's a pastor in uh, Australia, uh, Brendan Valiant, um, who wrote some some good things on biblical chronology, dealing with the calendars and, and so forth, even though I don't agree with everything that he wrote. He, he wrote this thing against the 2520. And so I had an exchange with him on Messenger, and he his main argument uh, was that, uh, first, that Manasseh's repentance came too late, so it must have been that his son was already born, Ammon must have already been born. And then when I brought up Isaiah uh, chapter 7 and 8, he argued that uh, Isaiah's wife must have been a virgin. And that, that the child that's going to be born here in 7 verse 14, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, must also be called not just Emmanuel, but Shir Jesha. Right? So it's the, it's the same child. But Isaiah's wife already has a son. Right? And there's no indication that this is some new wife. Right? She's called a prophetess. That's just the prophet's wife is called a prophetess. Right? And, and then when we look at the symbols of them, we have uh, two different signs that are going to be shown. Right? And it, the lands are going to be forsaken of both her kings. If we try to apply this to a child coming uh, to uh, maturity, I mean, I, I'm not sure what age you would call that, whether you're going to say 13. So you're going to say 14 years later. But that's referring to uh, this son. Uh, it's going to be 14 years later, butter and honey shall he eat. And so it's going to be referring to, because this is what you would have to say, is this, Isaiah's going to have a new wife who's going to give birth to a son. And uh, so it wasn't his first wife, this must be another wife. And that um, there's going to be two different signs with this same son. The first one is going to have to do when he's going to talk. So it, the, before he can speak, He's, he, uh, this confederacy will be ended by Assyria. And then you would have to argue that uh, before he comes to the age of accountability, um, that the land is going to be forsaken of both her kings. Um, now, how would that apply at all? Right. So, so, but that's what you would have to say. So you'd have to say that. But then the 65 years wouldn't have any place or any connection at all. And you wouldn't have this uh, uh, iteration within 65 years. So this iteration, this idea that something's repeated is simply within 65 years, what's going to happen to Ephraim is also going to happen to Judah. And what's going to happen to Ephraim? Ephraim will be broken, that it be not a people. Right? First is going to begin with the captivity of Hoshea. And that's going to happen with the captivity of Manasseh in 65 years. So hopefully that's um, clear what we're presenting here. I know it's, it's, it's a review, but it's important because there's going to be details that we need to take into account when we start looking at this repetition of history. So we know that there's going to be, um, that the king of Assyria is going to come, right? It says, in the same day shall the Lord shave the razor with it that is higher, namely by them beyond the river. Right. So the razor that is hired, that's going to be the king of Assyria. That's who uh, Ahaz is going to look to. Uh, the head of the hair of, of the feet, it shall consume the beard. So, so the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired. So the razor that's hired is Assyria, and it's going to um, 
shave the head and the hair of the feet, it shall also consume the beard. And what does that mean? The head of the hair, the, uh, the head, the hair of the feet, and the beard. Why is that illustration used? Anybody know? There's some pretty cryptic sort of uh, prophetic symbols being used here. Okay, well, let's let's look at some things. Now, we know in 2 Kings 16, verse 7 and 8, uh, so Ahaz sent messengers to tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rises up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. So he's going to be giving his tribute to the king of Assyria to deliver him from Reason and Pekka, right? Um, this is just going to be, again, uh, so it says here, And tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. For Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the house of the king and of the princes and gave it unto the king of Assyria, but he helped him not. So even though he paid this protection money, the king of Assyria is not going to help him. Okay, now we, we have that illustration in Ezekiel chapter 5 where he takes, um, uh, shaves his hair and his beard and he weighs the hair and so forth. Um, I'm going to leave that and there's not much help here. We, but what is the idea of shaving off a beard? Shaving the hair, sh- shaving the feet, which seems kind of odd. So this is referring to all of the bodily hair, not just the feet themselves. So why would this be done? So we know this is an indignity. It's a shame, right, to have this done, to have your beard shaved off. But every all of, all over your body, everything shaven. It shall come to pass in that day that a young man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. And it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall... that. They shall give, he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where they were, a thousand vines at a thousand, at a thousand siverlings. It shall be even be for briars and thorns. With arrows, with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all the hills that shall be digged with the mattock, There shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. So what's happening here is captivity. That's what's being referred to. So um, we know in chapter 8, moreover the Lord said unto me, take thee a great roll and write with a man's pen concerning Mahershala Hashbaz, right, which is... uh, Strange name to have, but it's uh, hastening to the prey or, or to the spoil and swift to the prey. Okay. And so I took unto me faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. So Isaiah is going to have this great role. This is a mirror. Um uh, this roll is a tablet for writing, by analogy, a mirror as a plate, a glass. So he's going to write this on a mirror concerning Maher Shalahashbaz. And he, and he has this witness, these witnesses. So the witnesses is Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. So why are these witnesses here? Would it be to give testimony? Okay, so so we have one is a priest. Okay, so but we have at the mouth of two or three witnesses. So we have some witnesses. Why do we need witnesses here? Okay, so this is talking about things that are going to happen shortly, right? The end of this uh, confederacy. So he has witnesses that can be trusted. So they're going to witness to the fact of what has happened, what was prophesied. 
So he has, uh, he writes this on a mirror, the name Mahashala Hashbaz. He has these witnesses, Uriah, the, who's the priest, and Zechariah, the son of Jeberekiah, um, uh, who specifically that is. I'm not certain. Um, and then he's going to uh, uh, have a child through his wife. He has a son, and his name's Mahershala Hashbaz. And the prophecy is that before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. So we don't know exactly the year that this occurs, but we know it's in that period, 740 to 739, that that's when Assyria is going to conquer uh, uh, Syria and Damascus and Samaria. But mostly it's, it's really about breaking up this confederacy. Okay. For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh, that go softly and rejoice in reason and Remaliah's son. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all the channels and go over all the banks. Right. So he's going to take captive Assyria or, or, or Syria and uh, northern Israel. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land. O Emmanuel. Now. He's going to come in and come up to the neck. Does he conquer? Does Assyria Take Judah, Judah captive. No, it's, good. it's not going to be Assyria. Well, we know that it's going to be Babylon. So when when is this referring to that they go up to the neck? And if Emmanuel is referring to Manasseh, would this be referring to Manasseh's captivity? That he comes up to the neck. So we, we have to keep these things in mind. The reason we're going over these details is we have to think about them in the context of the repeats of history, of how this that this civil war, how it relates to the symbols in our time. Now, one of the things about this is this is Isaiah eight eight. So we have that eight eight symbol. Where do we have the eight eight symbol? Ezekiah is going to cleanse the temple. In the first month, he opens the house of the Lord, the doors of the house of the Lord, and repairs them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together in the east street. Right? And he's going to, he says, um, Hear ye, Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthy, filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord, our God, and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. <clears throat> also, they shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned the incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore, the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem and hath delivered them to trouble to astonishment, to hissing as ye see with your eyes. So um, it says here, then the Levites arose in verse 12, and it names these different Levites and of the sons of all these different guys. And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And the priests went in the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it brought out all the uncleanness that was found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook. So uh, the priests are going to take this out of the most holy place, bring it out of the house, and then the Levites are going to bring this and put it in the brook, brook Hydra. And they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month, they came to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the 16th day of the first month, they made an end. So 
Uh, they're going to do eight days to cleanse the holy place and eight days to cleanse uh, or, or the most holy place and eight days to cleanse the holy place. Is that what it says? So on the eighth day of the month, they came to the porch. right? So they finished that on the eighth day. And they're going to then on the 16th day, they're going to make an end. So they come to the porch. So they do, do half of it. Is, is that what it says or am I reading it wrong? You would seem to be correct. Okay. So that's what it seems to say, and that's the way that we've understood it. Um, you know, some people try to understand it a little bit differently, but uh, that to me seems the most um, consistent. Um, so, and that, that um, so it says here, here's just one guy says, um, 14 uh, chiefs undertook the duty of collecting and preparing their brethren for the important work of cleansing the Lord's house, beginning with the outer courts, that of the priests and of the people. The cleansing of these occupied eight days, after which they set themselves to purify the interior. So this is what he says. But as the Levites were not allowed to enter within the walls of the temple, the priests brought all the sweepings out of the porch, out to the porch where they were received by the Levites and thrown into the book Kedron. This took eight days more. So so there's a difference of opinion regarding this. Some people say that it's going to be all the outer stuff cleansed first and then the house itself. Um, and, and maybe we should try to resolve this and figure out, um, because the position that this movement has taken was up that the holy place is cleansed by the priest and then the most holy place cleansed by the priest and the holy place cleansed by the Levites. So, so they, they have them working outside in, in this commentary. This is, uh, um, Jameson Fawcett Brown. Um, let me see other people's opinions. Um, the house, the porch, the courts, all the chambers belonging to him in 16 days. Um, so we know they have the 16 days. So one thing we can say is we have the 16 days. It's divided into eight and eight. Right? So that, that's the main thing that we want to look at here right now. I'm going to do a bit more research on this and try to see if there's some clues here in the scriptures uh, to how to understand this or what even uh, the spirit of prophecy, if she says anything about this at all. Um, uh, but the idea is that we have eight and eight. So when we go to Isaiah 8, 8, how would we connect this to Second Chronicles 29? It shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. The stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. So, so this is the stretching out of the wings of the king of Assyria, right? And uh, Emmanuel here would be referring to Manasseh who is a type of Christ. So what is there any significance in this being Isaiah 8, verse 8? No thoughts on this? <clears throat> I have not considered this in the past. Okay. Now, back in 2018, um, during the camp meeting that we had um, in October, uh, Jeff was trying to present on the number eight. Now, he never really got there. And after the camp meeting, he then presented in the morning worships dealing with the number eight. And one of the things that he had done is he had taken the, the 252 days from November 9th, 2019 to July 18, 2020, and he divided them in half. He said that the the 1260 and the 1260 uh, are going to represent uh, this cleansing period, right? So he put the eight and eight as a chiasm, right? So the priests and the Levites, eight days for the priests, eight days for the Levites. That was the idea. And uh, the center date of that, so if you go from November 9th, 2019, um, 
Let's quickly go there. We count 126 days. We come to March 14th, 2020. So it's going to, of course, going to be a Sabbath because November 9th was a Sabbath, July 18th is the Sabbath, and 18 times 7. So it's 18 weeks later. Um, and uh, so now that on a Julian date, it's March 1st, which symbolizes 31, which is the center of the cross. Um, and we know there's going to be, uh, so, so nothing happened on that date. But, but at the time, that's what Jeff had done. He had taken the symbol of eight and eight. I'm just telling you what, what he had done. But if we're going to take that as a basic idea that we're dividing the priests and the Levites with eight and eight to be 16, 16 days, uh, one of the things that, that when we get to the 16th day of the first month, what is that? It's after the 15th, which is after the 14th. Isn't that Feast of First Fruits? Yeah, so it's First Fruits, right? So they're going to finish on First Fruits. Now, we know that they can't keep a Passover that year. So they're going to have the second Passover. And um, so we need to take, keep some of these details in mind. We'll come back to these uh, tomorrow. So we'll come back and try to finish off this this part of this study. Um, um, chapter seven and eight, um, and then try to make some applications of how this how this fits in with our lines. So let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. We pray that you can bless each person who has participated, and that um, you can continue to lead and guide this movement as we seek to understand the message for this time. I pray that your angels can watch over each person, help us with our personal needs, our health, and other things that uh, come into play that bring discouragements. We pray, Lord, that we can be encouraged, that we can encourage one another. Uh, bring us together again tomorrow, according to thy will, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.